All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think we should get started on time today. Um, maybe a few people have caught on to the idea that they can watch the lectures on YouTube. That's fine. But on the other hand, if you're here, then you can, of course, ask questions. So trade off. But OK, so welcome to MIS once again. Um, today's topic will be um, a bit more about networks still and about location. So two, two big topics already. Um, first of all, organizational stuff. Uh, please remember the first exercise is due tomorrow. Shouldn't be too big of a problem. Um, if some of you still are working with the emulator and for the first exercise at least that's not a problem at all, um, then you can skip the part where we want uh, with the device information because of course that doesn't make too much sense for uh, the emulator on its own. Um, as I've already mentioned, you can borrow a physical device if you don't have one yet. We still have two or three available. Um, so that shouldn't be too big of a deal. And on Friday, again, we have the tutorial this time regarding um, intense activities and so on. So the major building blocks of Android. All right, but now let's um, look into networks. So today I'd like to talk a little more about the basics, especially about multiplexing. Um, and I'd like to discuss uh, a couple of examples for the three classes of networks, which we, the three big classes which we use every day, basically Bluetooth for a personal area network, Wi-Fi for a, a local area wireless network, and the whole GSM, LTE, and so on for a wide area networks. But first, uh, about multiplexing. So if you look at, if you remember the chart from last time, how, for example, in the United States, spectrum is allocated. So there's a huge amount of, of little blocks of spectrum assigned to, to specific use cases. And so spectrum is a very precious resource, actually. And for that reason, you need to find somewhere to, some way to share it. Um, especially uh, among multiple transmitters, for example. So you have different clients talking to the same uh, Wi-Fi access point. They're sharing the same frequency band. And so they somehow have to find a way to, to coexist. And that's called multiplexing. Um, it's also sometimes called a, a multiple access method. Uh, this will pop up time and again in the, um, in the acronyms, which, which we will now see. So the simplest one is so-called time division multiple access. So you simply create basically time slots. Uh, this is the static, uh, the static approach. You have um, yeah, one single transmitter may transmit in one time slot. And uh, that sort of requires that you have a synchronous clock so that all, all transmitters actually agree what the different time slots are. Um, can Anybody spot a drawback of that approach? So this is the really simple approach. Maybe you have three transmitters. Each one gets one second to transmit, and that goes, goes round robin fashion. Uh, every transmitter is allowed to transmit every three seconds. So um, what would be a drawback of that? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, synchronization, of course. So you need a common clock. Yeah, exactly. So you don't actually use the channel um, as much as you could. So every transmitter has two seconds of idle time, as you said. Um, so there's always, uh, even if the one transmitter would be able to transmit the whole time and the others don't have anything to do at all, he still has to wait his turn, basically, before it's able to transmit again. So for that reason, this isn't usually used anymore, that technique. That was only used in very, uh, very uh, early, very old wireless protocols. What's used now most of the time is uh, some kind of dynamic assignment, and that's simply called, uh, it has a very complex name, but uh, there's two aspects, carrier sensing and collision avoidance or collision detection. So before I tr start to transmit, I simply check if the channel is idle. So if somebody else is transmitting on the same frequency already, and if that's not the case, then I transmit myself. Um, there's a couple of issues with that too, which uh, you can try to avoid. So for example, if you have a situation like this, you have an access point 
in the middle and you have two stations uh, on the left, let's say simply on the left and right uh, edge of the transmission uh, radius. Then of course, this station X won't be able to, to receive the other station Y. But uh, since the access point in the center is able to receive both of them, they can still cause interference. So in this scenario, it might happen that station X tries to uh, sense a carrier, see if the channel is idle, doesn't receive anything, and starts to transmit. And station Y does exactly the same at the same time. And the result will be that you get two simultaneous incoming transmissions uh, at the access point in the center. And uh, then, of course, you get interference again, and nobody will actually be able to transmit. And for example, in Wi-Fi scenarios, um, you can turn on an optional feature, which is called request to send and clear to send. Um, then every station will first ask the access point, can I actually transmit now? Then it will get a token from the access point and only the one station which has the token is actually allowed to transmit. Then again, we get a similar problem to, to the previous scenario. We get lots of idle time because the stations have to wait for uh, the access point to give them the token so they're actually allowed to transmit. But if you have lots of so-called hidden nodes where uh, the stations can receive the access point but not each other, then you may have to turn on this feature even though uh, the, the channel utilization will get down, but in many cases, it will still be better than having, uh, having interference the whole time. So uh, some kind of trade-off again. And um, what's important to know also is that uh, after a transmission has been done, either uh, after the, the token has been received or immediately after the, the idle time has been detected on the channel, um, then the station has to wait for an acknowledgement. Because it's almost impossible, not entirely, but almost impossible to detect a collision while uh, you are transmitting on your own. For the simple reason that the signal you're sending out directly at your own antenna is uh, a million times stronger or 10 million times stronger than what you uh, would receive. So it would be extremely difficult, again, not impossible, but not usually done right now, uh, extremely difficult to separate out any additional incoming signals. Um, of course, at the access point then, both signals would have uh, about the same strength and then you can't separate them out anymore, so you would still have the interference problem. But it's very hard to detect that at a local station while it's transmitting. Okay, so, um, so much for the time division methods. Um, any questions about this? So the basic idea I think is clear. You, se you sense if the channel is, is free and then you transmit and then you wait if it actually worked or if you had some kind of, of hidden collision you couldn't detect because then you need to wait for the acknowledgement. All right, so one dimension is time, other dimension is frequency usually. So other approach would of course be to do frequency division, uh, division multiplexing. So um, simplest case would be you assign one channel, one subband uh, to one transmitter. And uh, then again, of course, you have the problem that you kind of waste a bit of, of bandwidth or a bit of, of channel space. Um, and the, uh, in, in all of these cases, the receiver, of course, has to uh, be able to cover a wider uh, frequency range uh, at the same time. So if you, for example, just a, the, just a brief example, if you look into Wi-Fi, that actually doesn't work that way. For, with Wi-Fi, uh, you may uh, not have noticed that with your access point at home maybe, you select one channel and it usually stays on that channel. You have some kind of auto channel selection where it may switch on its own, but in general, one Wi-Fi network is on one channel and uses exactly the method I discussed earlier. So it just uses time division on one single channel. Uh, 
but for more complex networks, you can spread them out over multiple channels. Of course, then the receiver will have to be more complex because it needs to cover more channels at, at, uh, at once. Um, there's also, so the simple way, of course, would be to just assign one channel to one transmitter and be done with it. Um, of course, there's much more complex uh, uh, variants in actual use, for example, this orthogonal frequency division multiple access, which is used in 4G, which uh, uses different uh, subcarriers. I won't go into too much detail here. This would, would go way beyond what, what we can cover in this course. But in the end, it's also a, a w some kind of frequency division method. And maybe as a side note, you also sometimes uh, get wavelength division multiple access, which is, of course, more or less the same, uh, same uh, thing as frequency division. Only if you have optical transmission, for example, in an optical fiber, then you talk about wavelength division. So you just have different channels, basically dip, uh, by having different light colors in the optical fiber. But it's, in the end, it's more or less the same as frequency division uh, multiple axes. And, um, Third method, there's a third method, even though we ha just have two dimensions, which is called code division multiple access. And this is now kind of a, 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 a hybrid between the two. The idea here is that you use a much wider um, frequency band to transmit than you would actually need for your data, but you modulate the data in such a way that you can overlay multiple transmissions even with interference, and still are able to separate them out from each other again. So um, two, two often used variants are, uh, are shown here. The one is frequency hopping, spread spectrum. All of these are called spread spectrum methods because they spread out the signal over a, a wider uh, frequency range than you would actually need just for the, for the data itself, basically. And by doing that, um, then you get at the same time uh, the ability to separate out the transmissions again. So this um, frequency hopping method, for example, s simply very rapidly switches, uh, switches channels according to a specific sequence. And when every transmitter uses a, a different sequence, then um, you are able to separate the transmissions from each other again afterwards. Even though they cover the same fre frequency band. Um, the other variant, uh, direct sequence spread spectrum, um, is a bit more complex. The basic idea here is that you take uh, basically a special random sequence of bits and modulate that with your actual data. You, the, this uh, pseudo-random sequence has a much higher data rate than the original data, so for uh, for one bit of data which you want to transmit, you perhaps actually transmit 10 bits of this pseudo-random data. And if every transmitter, again, uses a different sequence, then you can receive all of them at the same time and separate them out afterwards using signal processing. So this was a lot of, lot of information. I'll try to, to illustrate that briefly to, to make it clearer how the different, different approaches uh, work. So again, we have two dimensions. We have time and we have frequency. And uh, the assumption here is that we have, um, n now we have nine different tr transmitters at all, uh, in total. And um, each of them actually transmits the same amount of data over a certain time period. And so for time division, multiple exits, it's very simple. So this is actually the most, the, really the most basic variant where we have different time slots. And every time uh, it's the turn of one specific transmitter, if it has data, it transmits, and otherwise it doesn't. And uh, if you have the, the, uh, really the time slot based variant, then you get these kind of blank spaces where the channel is just idle even if maybe some of the transmitters would have, uh, would actually have data to transmit. If you have the d dynamic case, then uh, for example, T1 might actually be able to transmit again here once it realizes that nobody else is transmitting. All right, so for frequency dimension, multiple access, of course, um, similar approach, you have 
diff different transmitters. Each one is assigned uh, one single frequency band. And as you can see, the, the bandwidth you actually need for that to work is, is larger. But on the other hand, you can get, uh, of course, you can get more simultaneous transmissions at the same time because they, they don't interfere with each other. And um, so these are the two straightforward ones. And for code division multiple access, I've tried to illustrate that using, uh, using colors kind of. So you use even more bandwidth. So uh, the idea is for the actual signal to transmit, you would just need as much bandwidth as, as the other ones, just this, this slice of spectrum. But you use a much, much wider uh, uh, channel, basically, or a much wider band to transmit. And by using different modulation codes, then you can actually overlap the transmissions and are still able to, to separate them out again afterwards. I've tried to illustrate that using, using different colors. So the idea here is that you basically spread out the transmission over a much wider, uh, wider range of spectrum. And um, so the amount of data which actually goes through in this transmission is just the same as in this one. So the effective bandwidth is much smaller, but yeah, again, it's, it's kind of spread out. All right, so much for multiple access, we already know this one. Um, so what we've been talking about now is mostly on these lowest two layers. So this is really about the physical hardware um, that's transmitting radio signals and about the, the very low level protocols on top of this. So for example, the, the protocols used by Wi-Fi are in the so-called data link layer, which simply uh, are responsible for looking, uh, for example, for uh, distributing these, these transmission tokens from the access point to the, to the stations, and also for um, sending acknowledgments that the data has actually been received, for example. Um, yeah, to summarize, we have three commonly used methods to, to share a channel among different, different devices. We have time division, we have frequency division, and we have code division, multiple access. And most of these take place in the lowest two layers of this OSI stack, so the rest isn't actually uh, really involved here so far. Yes, please. Um, yes and no. So the first two ones are, uh, have also been used with analog transmitters and receivers and with digital ones. The, uh, so actually uh, broadcast radio. Is, people have been using that for, I don't know, 120 years. is actually frequency division access because each band has one radio station, each frequency that's just FDMA, so uh, this has been used with analog technology for, for 100 years at least. And um, for time division access, uh, this, I think this also has been used uh, for analog transmissions already, um, but it really started to become popular with digital ones because you have to be quite fast actually. Um, to, to switch between the different transceivers if you want to have any meaningful amount of bandwidth. And for code division access, then you definitely need a digital transceiver because you need these, these bit sequences which you need to separate out afterwards. But the first two have also been used with, with analog systems. Um, actually, if you think about it, if you have something like CB radio or, or the, even, even more simpler uh, walkie-talkies, then that's actually time division multiple access because you, you listen to the other guys, then you say over, then you release the, the, the button and you stop sending and then the other guy can talk. So that's basically time division multiple access. Are there other questions uh, about multiple access networks in general? 